We will continue to study the proposals that have been made. Infrastructure development spending will be sustained at 5 to 6 percent of GDP. The planned expansion of infrastructure projects, I believe, would be possible if we continue to encourage the participation of the private sector in the development of our programs. Public-private partnerships, or PPPs, hold great potential for that expansion, for infrastructure development and for innovation. Our infrastructure development is of primary importance as it is a necessary element to improve many other sectors, to include agriculture, tourism, general economic activity, and even to governance. It is my belief also that we have missed some great opportunities to develop our rail transport system. It is clear in my mind that railways offer great potential as it continues to be the cheapest way of transporting goods and passengers. We can build upon already existing lines by modernizing these old railway systems. There are dozens of railway projects on the ground, above the ground, below ground, not just in Manila, but in other regions, at various stages of implementation and with a combined cost of 1.9 trillion pesos. This administration is committed to finish building the current portfolio of investments, approved railway projects such as the North-South Commuter Railway System, the 33-kilometer Metro Manila Subway Project, the 147-kilometer North-South Commuter Railway System, the 12-kilometer LRT1 Cavite Extension, the 23-kilometer MRT7, and the common station that will connect LRT1, MRT3, and MRT7. And beyond NCR, larger-scale railway systems like the 102-kilometer Mindanao Railway Project The Panay Railway Project and the Cebu Railway System will be integrated as a vital part of our transport and communication systems. We will also continue to improve our roads and transportation systems in key cities throughout the country through various projects such as the Cebu Bus Rapid Transit, Davao High Priority Bus System, Ilocos Norte Transportation Hub, the El Nido Transport Terminal. My order to the Department of Transportation, or DOTR, is really very simple. Full speed ahead. <laughs> Improving our railway system, along with modernizing existing airports and seaports, will maximize our strategic location in the Pacific and connect our many islands. A key sector in our transformation plans is that of energy. Another fundamental requirement for growth and increased employment will be the availability of cheap, reliable energy. This even comes under the, e the category of ease of doing business. If we are to attract investors, both local and foreign, to set up shop here in the Philippines. At present, our demand for energy far exceeds our reliable supply. We must increase the level of energy production. We must look at every possible option that would be appropriate for the Philippine situation. There is some room to expand our present power supply through existing power sources, but this is only to a very limited extent. We must build new power plants. especially in the areas of renewable energy. Our search for new power sources should always be with an eye to improving the mix of the energy supply between traditional and renewable sources. The technology on renewable energy is progressing rapidly, and many of these technologies are appropriate for the Philippines. We have already begun windmill power, we are now expanding very quickly our solar power production. 
for both offshore and onshore wind turbines, for example. The World Bank has calculated that there is a potential for 255 gigawatts by the year of 2030. <laughs> Solar power has steadily increased its efficiency in converting sunlight to electrical power, which is particularly attractive for the Philippines. Because unlike wind power, Solar power is practical almost everywhere in the Philippines all year round. In the move to lowering our carbon footprint caused by energy production, our advancement to renewables will have a lead time. In the interim, natural gas will hold the key. We will provide investment incentives by clarifying the uncertain policy in upstream gas, particularly in the area close to Malampaya. This requires clarification of the processes and review of service contracts policy. I believe that it is time also to re-examine our strategy towards building nuclear power plants in the Philippines. We will comply, of course, with the International Atomic Energy Agency regulations for nuclear power plants as they have been strengthened after Fukushima. In the area of nuclear power, there have been new technologies developed that allow smaller scale modular nuclear plants and other derivations thereof. Once again, PPPs will play a part in support as funding in this period is limited. Furthermore, we must examine the entire system of transmission and distribution for the purpose of finding ways to lower the price of energy to the consumer and to industry. We must expand the network of our transmission lines while examining schemes to improve the operation of our electrical cooperatives. All this in aid of reducing energy costs, especially but not limited to households. All this impetus for development and growth we undertake within the context of accelerating climate change and extreme weather conditions. Though we are a minor contributor to climate change globally, we have the unfortunate distinction of being one of the most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change. For the welfare of our people, it is incumbent upon us to alleviate the effects of that vulnerability. The use of renewable energy is at the top of our climate agenda. We will increase our use of renewable energy sources, sources such as hydropower, geothermal power, solar, and wind. Geographically, we are a disaster-prone country. Capacity building for our natural disaster resiliency is therefore a must. Investment in science and technology is imperative to enable us to have accurate weather forecasts and on-time disaster alerts. Studies show that already now, many areas in the Philippines are at high risk from the rise in sea levels brought about by the increase in global temperature. We must adapt to this phenomenon with disaster-proof planning for our communities. We will also look into the precarious fresh water supply situation in the country, especially in our urban areas. Many of our water supply systems date back to the 1950s, and they must now be rehabilitated and improved. I've instructed the DNR, together with the DPWH, to explore possible partnerships with the private sector to address this crucial situation. The Philippines has excellent laws on the environment, but we have to guarantee that these laws are properly enforced. And this will require a great deal of coordination and cooperation between concerned government agencies and private stakeholders. Companies who exploit our natural resources must follow the law. We all have the responsibility to preserve this earth, for we are but custodians and we will pass on this great treasure to future generations. There is no question that the preservation of the environment 
is the preservation of life. If we, if we cannot mitigate climate change, all our plans for the economy, all our plans for our future will be for naught. Bawat Pilipino sa ibayong dagat na nagsasakripisyong lisanin ang kanyang pamilya sa Pilipinas upang maghanap buhay ay nararapat lamang magkaroon ng pamahalaang matatawag nilang tahanan habang nasa ibang bayan. Ito ang papel na gagampanan ng kagawaran ng manggagawang mandarayuhan o Department of Migrant Workers matapos itong ideklara bilang ganap na ahensya ng gobyerno ng isang taon. Ang kagawaran ito ang magsisilbing kanlungan ng ating mga kababayan sa gitna ng mundong walang kasiguruhan at mahigpit na kompetisyon. Ito ang maglalatag sa kanila ng mga oportunidad. Titiyak na ang kanilang mga hanap buhay ay tugma sa kanilang mga kasanayan. Maninigurong akma ang sahod at maayos ang kalagayan sa kanilang mga kumpanya at mga ngalaga sa kanilang mga pamilya habang sila ay nasa malayo. Gagawin natin ito sa pamamagitan ng pag-aalis ng red tape sa, sis sa sistema ng pagsusulong ng digital empowerment. We shall automate the verification of contracts and issue secure overseas employment certifications that you can keep on your smartphone. I call on the Department of Migrant Workers and the DICT to make this a top priority. Tinatawagan ko rin ang Department of Foreign Affairs na makipagtulungan sa Department of Migrant Workers na tiyakin ang lahat ng mga diplomatic post ay tutulong na agarang maibalik sa trabaho ang mga ating mga overseas Filipino workers na nawalan ng hanap buhay nitong nakalipas na ilang taon. Mula... Mula sa tatlong buwan ay gagawin na lang nating tatlong linggo para sa isang dayuhang employer na iproseso ang mga papeles ng Pilipinas ng Pilipinong nais nitong kunin bilang empleyado. Aatasan din natin ang kagawara, kagawaran ng gawing simple, ang komplikadong handbook ng mga tuntunin at regulasyon para sa mga OFW. Nang sa gayon ay maging malwan ang mga transaksyon may kinalaman sa kanilang pangingibang bansa. Mula sa handbook na may dalawang daan at apat na pong seksyon ay gagawin nating pamphlet na lamang na hindi hihigit sa isandang pahina. Mahirap na nga ang buhay. Kaya naman, ayaw pa natin makitang lalo pang nahihirapan ang ating mga manggagawang mandarayuhan sa pagtupad sa kanilang mga pangarap. Para sa mga kababayan nating naiipit sa kaguluhan, inaabuso at nanganganib ang buhay, ikinagagalak kong sa ilalim ng aking pamumuno ay ilulunsad natin ang One Repatriation Command Center o ORCC. Ilalaan natin ang isang social media platform ng Department of Migrant Workers at ang hotline upang matulungan agad at maligtas sila mula sa mas higit na kapahamakan. Noon, nangungutang pa ang isang ina ng bawat OFW upang sumakay ng barko para pumunta sa Maynila at mga tok sa iba't ibang ahensya para mapauwi ang anak na inaapi. Ngayon, kami na ang tatawag sa mga magulang ng OFW para sabihin sa kanila para sabihin sa kanila ang petsya kung kailan nila mayayakap at makakapiling ang kanilang mga anak. Sa kasalukuyan ay nakikipag-ugnayan tayo sa pamahala ng Saudi Arabia upang buksan muli ang deployment. Kaya natin at gagawin natin ang makipagnegosasyon na mabigyan ang ating mga kababayan doon ng tamang, tamang pasahod at mapangalagaan ang kanilang karapatan at kapakanan. 
Mula na, mula na, muli natin patitibayin ang respeto at pagkakaibigan ng ating dalawang bansa tulad ng namamagitan sa ating ama sa kanilang hari. Sa mga susunod na buwan ay magtutungo si Secretary Susan Ople sa Saudi Arabia upang tiyakin na may sapat na puwersang magsisiguro na mabubuksan muli ang empleyo sa bansa at para maisulong ang ating kampanya laban sa human trafficking. Ngayon, para naman sa mga anak na naiwan sa Pilipinas, titiyakin ng Department of Migrant Workers sa pamamagitan ng OWA na sila ay maipapasok sa magagandang paaralan, magtuturo sa kanila ng financial literacy, mental wellness, sports, sining, kultura. Ito ay mangyayari sa pakikipagtulungan ng iba't ibang ahensya ng pamahalaan. Alagaan natin ang kabataang Pilipino sapagkat sila ang kinabukasan ng ating inambayan. Sa ating mga kababayan na nasa ibang bansa, you deserve a home in government, not only for the money that you send home, but you are not cold tools of the economy. You deserve it for your sacrifices for our country and your perseverance and excellence in the global arena. You OFWs represent the fighting faith of the Filipinos as a nation and as a people. Let us transform your overseas journey into inspirational stories for all time. Thanks to you, our dear legislators, and of course to the man every OFW now refers to as their tatay, President Rodrigo Duterte, you passed the law that created this new home for our OFWs. On the area of foreign policy, I will not preside over any process that will abandon even one square inch of territory of the Republic of the Philippines to any foreign power. to our place in the community of nations, the Philippines shall continue to be a friend to all, an enemy to none. The Philippines has always been open and welcoming to all our foreign friends and visitors. That is our worldview. That is our culture. But let me be clear. We are very jealous of all that is Filipino. We will be a good neighbor, always looking for ways to collaborate and cooperate with the end goal of mutual, mutually beneficial outcomes. If we agree, we will cooperate and we will work together. And if we differ, let us talk some more until we develop a consensus. After all, that is the Filipino way. But we will not waver. We will stand firm in our independent foreign policy with a national interest as our primordial guide. We commit to maintaining good relations with the rest of the world. As a matter of fact, it is my sincere belief that the need for strong bonds and collaboration among nations emerges in the direst of times such as in a pandemic. The partnerships and alliances that we make with all will provide stability that all nations will need as we emerge into this new global economy. The Philippines will continue to promote stronger and multifaceted relationships with all our partners around the world. We are, in fact, grateful for the messages of support and offers of help that we have received from many of our friends in the international community. This has been communicated to us through the different envoys and ambassadors here in the Philippines. 
Such strong relationships can... I am here today addressing the legislature. Allow me now to propose legislation that we would like you to pass in support of these programs. One, National Government Right Sizing Program, a reform mechanism that seeks to enhance the government's institutional capacity to perform its mandate and to provide better services while ensuring optimal and efficient use of resources. Compared to previous government reorganization efforts, the NGRP will entail a comprehensive strategic review of the functions, operations, organization, system, and processes of the different agencies and massive and transformational initiatives in agencies concerned, such as mergers, consolidations, splitting, transfer, and even the abolition of some offices. The right-sizing efforts will also involve, involve the conduct of a comprehensive strategic review of functions, programs, and, progr and projects that will cut across various agencies. Number two, a budget modernization bill. This seeks to institutionalize a cash-based budgeting system under Executive Order Number 91, Series 2019, to strengthen fiscal discipline in the allocation and use of budget resources by ensuring that every peso budgeted by the government would lead to the actual delivery of programs and projects. The full implementation of the CBS is timely and vital as the government executes response and recovery plans post-pandemic. Number three, Tax Package 3 Valuation Reform Bill. This bill provides for the A, establishment of real property values and valuation standards across the country, and B, the development of real property information system that provides for the database of all real property transaction and declarations in the country. Number four, Passive Income and Financial Intermediary Taxation Act. This seeks to reform the taxation of capital income and financial services by redesigning the financial sector, trans financial sector taxation into simpler, fairer, more efficient, and a revenue-neutral tax system. It also represents to adopt a regionally competitive tax system. Number five, E-Government Act, which provides for the establishment of the E-Government Master Plan, which shall cover all E-Government services and processes. Number six, the Internet Transaction Act, or E-Commerce Law, which aims to establish an effective regulation of commercial activities through the Internet or electronic means to ensure that consumer rights and data privacy are protected, innovation is encouraged, fair advertising practices and competition are promoted. Online transactions are secured, intellectual property rights are protected, and product standards and safety are observed. Number seven, government financial institutions unified initiatives to distress enterprises for economic recovery. This seeks to provide financial assistance to distressed enterprises critical to economic recovery through programs and initiatives to be implemented by the Land Bank of the Philippines, the Development Bank of the Philippines, and the Philippine Guarantee Corporation for purposes of addressing liquidity or solvency problems of MSMEs and strategically important industries to encourage their continued operation and maintain employment. Number eight, the establishment of a medical reserve corps. Establishes a medical reserve corps under the Health and Emergency Management Bureau of the DOH. The MRC shall be composed of licensed physicians, medical students who have completed their four years of medical courses, graduates of medicine, registered nurses, licensed and licensed allied health professionals. Number nine, National Disease Prevention Management Authority. This bill seeks to create the Center for Disease Prevention and Control attached to the DOH. <laughs> Number 10, the creation of the Virology Institute of the Philippines. 
This will create the Virology Science and Technology Institute of the Philippines as an attached agency of the DOST. All offices and units under the DOST with functions related to virology shall now be transferred to the Virology Institute of the Philippines. Number 11, the Department of Water Resources. This seeks to create the Department of Water Resources and adopts the integrated water resource management as the strategic framework for national water management policy making and planning. Number 12, Unified System of Separation, Retirement, and Pension. This grants a monthly disability pension in lieu of disability benefits provided under existing laws for military and uniformed personnel retired by reasons of disability. Number 13, the E-Governance Act. It promotes the use of internet, internet, and other ICT to provide opportunities for citizens. Number 14, the National Land Use Act. This will provide for a rational and holistic management and development of our country's land and water resources. Hold owners accountable for making these lands productive and sustainable. Strengthen the LGU to manage ecological balance within its jurisdiction. It also provides for land use and physical planning framework as a mechanism in determining policies and principles to implement this legislative measure. Number 15, the National Defense Act. This seeks to amend the antiquated National Defense Act of 1935 to provide for a change in the military structure of the armed forces of the Philippines that is more responsive to current and future non-conventional security threats to the country's territorial integrity and national sovereignty. Number 16, Mandatory Reserve Officers Training Corps and National Service Training Program. This seeks to reinstitute the ROTC program as, mandatory, as a mandatory component of senior high school programs, grades 11 and 12, in all public and private tertiary level educational institutions. The aim is to motivate, train, organize and mobilize students for national defense preparedness, including disaster preparedness and capacity building for risk-related situations. <laughs> Number 17, enactment of an enabling law for the national, natural gas industry. This seeks to foster the development of the midstream natural gas industry in a bid to strengthen Philippine energy security by diversifying the country's primary sources of energy and promoting the role of natural gas as a complementary fuel to variable renewable energy. Number 18, amendments to the Electric Power Industry Reform Act, or EPIRA. This aims to improve the implementation of the law's provisions and enhance its effectiveness to address the high cost of electricity, alleged market collusion, and insufficient power supply. The bill seeks to restructure the Energy Regula Regulation Commission to foster accountability and improve the Commission's government system that would ensure consumer protection and in enhancing competitive operation of the electricity market. Number 19, amendments to the Build Operate Transfer Law. This seeks to improve the implementation of the public-private partnership program and to be able to direct the desired outputs and outcomes in line with the strategic development targets of the country. Specifically, the amendments seek to, one, address the ambiguities in, in the existing law, two, address the bottlenecks and challenges affecting the implementation of the PPP program, and three, foster a more competitive and enabling environment for PPPs. To my fellow Filipinos, ang aking mga minamahal na kababayan, Batid ko na hindi madali 
ang ating pinagdaraanan sa nakaraang higit na dalawang taon. Alam ko rin na ang bawat isa sa inyo ay ginagawa ang lahat ng inyong makakaya upang patuloy na harapin ang lahat na pagsubok sa kasalukuyan. I do not intend to diminish the risks and the challenges that we face in this turbulent time in global history. And yet, I see sunlight filtering through these dark clouds. We have assembled the best Filipino minds to help navigate us to this global crisis that we are now facing. We will endure. Let our Filipino spirit ever remain undimmed. I know this in my mind. I know it in my heart. I know it in my very soul. The state of the nation is sound. Thank you and good afternoon. Marami pong salamat sa inyo lahat. Ladies and gentlemen, on the part of the Senate, the joint session is adjourned. On the part of the House of Representatives, the joint session is adjourned. Inyo pong nasaksiyan ang unang sona ni Pangulong Bongbong Marcos Jr. Himayin pa po natin yan sa pagbabalik ng special coverage ng One News at One PH. All sides, all the time.